There, hi, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm gonna go here to full screen. Um, and uh, Marinka, is everything looking okay? Uh, everything looks great. We can see, we, you're sharing your screen and we can also see your face. All right, perfect. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, as Marinka said, I have uh, uh, just recently moved from uh, a position in um, uh, 23andMe and in industry around therapeutic development to come to Harvard uh, and start a, another chapter. Um, uh, and that's uh, founding this uh, center. So I'm going to Oops, come on, you jump past my abstract. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about that role, uh, just so folks see where I'm coming from. This talk is a little different than I usually like to give because I haven't been involved in um, directly in the COVID uh, analyses, and most of the work um, from 23andMe sort of stays there. So th these will be these sort of more forward-looking thoughts, and and mostly what I want to do is share a little bit of information about why I think genetics is important in drug discovery. A little bit about uh, you know aspects of of target identification and drug development, which are relevant uh, even for repurposing, um, and then talk about why I think uh, it's really essential that we think about host virus interactions, and then you know when the next pandemic comes, you know, m my thoughts are really around how do we develop and curate data sets that will be suitable for querying and providing us with the sort of rich information that we need in order to start to, to move things forward. And, and uh, you know, one of the talks yesterday from Nevin Krogan sort of, you know, gave me some evidence for why this might be interesting if we can do it well, which is, you know, for COVID, we, we really had to go back and start from ground zero to get going. And even there, you know, uh, as he said, they're now starting to look at, you know, some of this information that might have been useful from the, the, the sort of previous uh, coronavirus infections in humans, etc. And so I just want to sort of talk through, like, what, what are the, the, the sort of things that we might do now to generate data so that in the future we're able to come in and query that data and get insight into a new uh, arising pathogen. Okay, so uh, a little uh, plug for what I'm doing now. So the, the center at, at Harvard is going to fill a number of roles. One is to identify important technology innovations and basically help move that uh, into different labs and different places. I think this is a thing that happens well in industry and I've seen it you know, throughout companies. We find a technology, we like it, and we move it into different groups in, in the company, whether that's antibody discovery or small molecule work. And you've seen people talking about these topics here, but universities don't do that as well. And there's no good reason not to be thinking about doing that. So Harvard Medical School is gonna engage in that. You can think of some of it as technology transfer. Um, the other piece that I think uh, happens much better in industry than in academia is this notion of identifying large, broadly useful data sets um, that you, you know, sort of curate, you put them on a, a hardware platform that makes them easy to query and easy to ask questions about and then develop a sort of user experience that allows people to access those. And I, build, building this, I think, is really a, a key to success for the center. And I think it's a key to success for science you know, if you think about something like the Human Cell Atlas or similar efforts at, at other places, we're not going to write the papers uh, that describe every interesting feature of that data or of, of similar data that comes along. We, we really sort of have to get away from the notion that, you know, that important stuff will appear in a paper and then we can read the paper and pull it out. We're going to have to learn how to sort of cut out that middleman for a whole bunch of questions and, and really be able to go into data much more than we are currently and come out of it with, with some amount of knowledge uh, that we can use to inform uh, short-term experiments uh, and, and development as you might want to do, for example, if there was another pandemic, but you'd, you'd do it for lots of other kinds of research as well. And then at Harvard, there's the, the sort of main uh, medical school on campus called the Quad uh, and a whole bunch of uh, research hospitals are, are sort of located in the same area and fostering collaboration between those is again, something that I'll try to do. As I said, in this talk, I'm really gonna focus on data um, one of my frustrations uh, uh, that will come through a little bit in, in this is uh, having been on the industry side, 
so many of the academic data sets put uh, you know, restrictions on them that say you can't use these for commercial purposes. And, and the, the bad thing about that is that it, it then precludes all of the things that you want to do. If you think about the work that, that Nevin Krogan and others did, they, they couldn't actually do that if they were collaborating with a pharma in that uh, opportunity, but using some of these public resources without some kind of an exception. It's, it's really unfortunate that people are not thinking a lot more broadly about the fact that yes, your data is kind of interesting and you put a lot of effort into generating it, but you need to make it a little bit freer. Um, otherwise, we won't be able to have these collaborations that go between academia and industry. Um, and and you know, all, all that happens, it, it's not the case that somebody gets rich because people buy their data. What happens is we don't do the science, right? That's, that's the real end of that. And so I'm going to try as much as I can over the next handful of years to get people to stop putting odd restrictions on their data and, and really make it uh, uh, free for people to, to work on. Um, this central role, um, you know, if you think about companies like Netflix or 23andMe or Google, in fact, that, that, that's how they live and breathe. They have big data sets that are amazingly important for the company. They're very rich assets. And what they do is use those assets to further their uh, sort of designs and and in science we we need to move to that model uh, sooner rather than later. We can't rely so much on on sort of publication and individual silos. I think uh, Nevin also had a fantastic picture of the silos. Right, the silos are killing us uh, in in public science. Um, I will focus mostly on the things I know about, uh, and that's only because they're the things I know a bit about. I'm happy to talk to other people about other things, but human genetics and genomics, and in, in genomics, I do include proteomics and, and uh, metabolomics and things like that. So, so um, use of uh, machine learning models, and again, Marinka and Yuri have, have just done this fantastic job of laying out why graph convolutional networks are worth some of our time to think about, but there are lots of others, and, and uh, you know, but I think there are some things that we can do there. Um, and then really in, in this model of being able to query big data sets and get stuff back is, is to not only get back sort of these facts, but also to get some notion of uncertainty. Um, and, and again, that's a, a challenge that we have in computational science, I believe. Um, like if, if I read a paper, no matter what paper it is, by the end of it, I have a sense of, was this a careful scientist that really did a fantastic job? Or were there some corners cut and the, the facts that they've presented are maybe true, but I would want some more uh, details to, to, to drill into that. And if you contrast that with what happens now, if I query a large database, a scientific database, I sort of get back the response to my query without any sort of, uh, uh, sort of labeling around it. You know, did I was this uh, data point that I got, you know, unusual in some way? Was it usual, right? And so we we do have a lot of work to do to try to convey uh, th that sort of information back to the user. So when you pull facts out of a database that says, "Hey, this gene is highly expressed in this tissue," you know, maybe a caveat that, okay, well, in three people it didn't have a high expression, and twenty five it did. So you know, it's not universal as a fact, kind of thing or some of the data that you're basing this on is was collected under an unusual protocol. So you, you may want to be more skeptical of it. Um, and, and we're going to have to figure out how to do that, how to take data and metadata and put them together. And it, it, it will be hard, but I think it will it is essential. So now I'm going to switch from, from that to here, here's, here's some stuff that I think is, is hopefully useful to people who are, want to work in, in this field. So target identification is what I did a fair amount of at Genentech and pretty much exclusively worked on it at 23andMe as we built up the therapeutics department there. And in some ways, you can think of repurposing drugs as, as really a way to identify new indications for which this existing therapeutic may be beneficial. And, and that's great. Um, it's not as simple, uh, you know, few, few folks I've heard say things like, well, it's an already an approved drug, so it's safe and efficacious. Th that's not necessarily true. Um, and and, and who, you benefit from stepping back and, and looking through the, the details, what happened in the clinical trial, what were the adverse events, how frequent were they, etc. cetera. Um, but by and large, what you're doing is now saying, okay, I want to tar target either a different disease with the same a gene or, or Right? And so what's going on there? 
um, and some rationale for considering these candidates known biological function. Does this gene actually, or this drug actually hit a gene? Do we know what it does? Is it in the right pathway? Do we have available genetic data that relates the variation in that gene or around that gene to phenotypic variation that you think is associated with the, the, the disease of interest? Um, and again, you know, I think these are important aspects, whether or not you're repurposing a drug or developing one in initially. Um, and then available functional data. Are they compelling at the cellular level? So if you think of NASH or NAFLD, uh, these fatty liver diseases, and I have a variant that I think is, uh, or a gene that I think we should target for that. Do I see things in the assays that I can understand as potentially being relevant to the et etiology of the disease? And of course, this is much harder and you can assay these at a cellular level. Um, when you step out of that for things like hypertension, well, there's just not a cellular assay that's going to get you at hypertension. And that makes it harder to think about whether a, any target works there. And the same will be true for repurposing. And that's you know, where we need broader phenotypic information to help us and genetic information. Okay, so what happens when we identify a target? Uh, we need to uh, decide whether we need an agonist or an antagonist. We see uh, certainly from genetic data that there are lots of variants in the genome that have pleiotropic effects. So a, a, a variant uh, may uh, increase my risk for skin cancer and at the same time decrease my risk for a, a um, uh, 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 immune or autoimmune disease like psoriasis or uh, hyperthyroidism, right? It's, it's that opposing direction. So a drug that targets that gene has, you know, the potential to have uh, on-target issues, right? You, if you block it in one direction, maybe we restrict or reduce the risk of cancer, but we must then sort of increase the risk of these other diseases. And so it's important to have that phenotypic and genetic information available to you. Um, how potent is this? How potent does it need to be? So again, these are great questions. For some uh, uh, genes, we can get a phenotypic effect if we you know, have 50% potency. For other uh, types of genes, we need to be in the 90 or 95% uh, effect, efficacy range in order to see any sort of phenotypic advantage. Um, and so again, this is, it just comes back to uh, the, the whole issue of re purposing, you're going to need to know stuff about PK, PD, et cetera, um, to get a sense of whether this is going to work in the new place. Much of this data is published and known. Uh, it just doesn't seem to come into many of the repurposing discussions. May, maybe it comes in further down the track, but it seems odd to me that they're not brought in a little bit sooner. Um, as I alluded to earlier, every clinical trial that's run has some side effects that get reported. Uh, if you want to repurpose that drug, it's important that you look at what those side effects are, how frequent they are, because they sometimes will be indicative of even worse side effects if you start to go into a new indication of where those side effects might be tolerable in one indication, they won't be in, in others. What does the safety profile look like? And I'll come back to that, but you know, for uh, oncology targets, a uh, safety profile can be, can be not a, a that good. People are, are dying of their disease. And if we have a drug that has you know, some ability to extend that, then, then that, that would be seen by people to be beneficial. But if you know, I have psoriasis and, and uh, you know, the, the drug that I'm gonna take for that disease in some sense has to be as safe as water, right? I'm gonna take it for a long period of time and I'm not willing to accept a, a, as a patient any a, you know, increase in risk for a disease that might kill me or, or certainly not any appreciable risk. So there are really different strategies for these things. So drugs that you know, get approved in one indication don't always move across to other indications and one has to be pretty careful about thinking uh, those things through. Um, and then uh, uh, agonists, uh, you know, if we can talk about these. So one of the strategies, and this comes back to some of the network model, um, you know, I want to make a drug that makes a gene work better. That turns out to be really hard, but sometimes what I can do instead is to antagonize something that negatively regulates that gene. So I get the same effect as, a, as an agonist, but I need to be one step back. And so that means I need a under, mechanistic understanding of the biology to make that work. And it won't be that, that the repurposed drug targets the, the gene of interest, it has to target something upstream. 
So repurposing, what do you need? You need the right uh, target, which is gene or genes. You need to know what direction am I agonizing or antagonizing. Almost all drugs that are, are, uh, have been approved are antagonists. It's much easier to get things to stop working than it is to make them work better. Um, a right modality. So again, we saw some discussion of this, uh, large or small molecules. So large molecules are typically antibodies or protein products. Um, they need to be uh, usually delivered by either a intravenous or sub-Q uh, injection for AMD and some of the eye diseases that are an injection directly into the eye. Um, and then small molecules, which are, are pills that you take. Um, and, and different people will, will uh, uh, you know, for, for diseases, it, commercial success often depends on whether you can get a small molecule or whether you can get a large molecule with a dosing regimen, right? People won't want to go in for intravenous injections every two weeks, um, you know, for a disease that isn't bothering them very much, but they have no problem taking a pill every day. So you have to sort of get that right. Uh, as I alluded to before, the bioavailability is, is essential. Um, you need the right sort of PKPD profile for the thing you're going in. And then, as I said, this, this safety profile. So these are all things that, that, that come up in different places. I hope it's useful to just out, lay them down here. Um, agonizing. So one of the nice things that's come out in the last decade or so, at least I think is fantastic, is that we moved to, to a world where it's, it's really quite fascinating that you don't need to always restore total function. And we're seeing uh, great examples where uh, partial uh, function is enough to provide people with substantial quality of life. Um, you know, Roche's uh, Helimbra, I love for hemophilia A, basically it's a a bi-specific antibody, uh, and so because the, the if you have that genetic defect, the factor 9A and factor uh, uh, 10 don't actually come together naturally, but if I make an antibody that binds to each of them, can I get them close enough um, to, to provide that natural coagulation cascade? And restoring some fraction of that turns out to give people with hemophilia A a, a substantially improved quality of life, so it's really a fantastic one. The uh, Spinraza drug, uh, you know, which basically goes in and changes splicing uh, in, in, in a particular gene in the brain. Uh, you know, again, efficacy is not huge, but little changes have really changed the, the world for people with that disease. And then similarly for cystic fibrosis, again, we, you know, we, we can't improve things 100%, but small improvements actually in those cases have, have really improved quality of life. And so here's a place where there's an opportunity to start thinking about, you know, are there diseases, you know, can, can we categorize the, the diseases where small uh, changes in efficacy will be, you know, amazingly beneficial. Um, why genetics? So why do I think genetics is important? That's why I moved to 23andMe. Uh, Matt Nelson and others back in, in uh, um, I'm trying to remember when this was, about 2000. 15, I think, showed that essentially if you use human genetics as the basis um, for uh, determining a target, you could double the success rate in pharma. And then the same is true uh, here from um, a more recent paper in 2019 from, from folks at AbbVie, the same idea. In the right conditions, we get a greater than twofold increase in, in, in sort of likelihood of success. And so if that's true for developing a novel target, I would just argue this is an important consideration and should come back into how we think about repurposing uh, uh, therapeutics. All right, so now I'm gonna transition. I better check and see where I'm at for time. Okay, so while um, these uh, vaccines are important, it's great to, to develop vaccines and hopefully people don't get infected, but there will always be a proportion of people that get infected for a variety of reasons. There are people for whom the vaccine won't work. The early in the, the uh, sort of epidemic or pandemic, there'll be people that get infected no matter what. Um, and so I think there should be a lot of interest and that's where my own personal interest is in understanding the host virus interactions. And we'd like to use genetics as a basis for that discovery. And I'll try to t go through and explain why I think that is. Um, and we can think about these sort of host cellular factors. So again, I think it's been outlined a few times, but viruses are small. 
they uh, basically need to take advantage of a whole bunch of stuff in the host to get anything done. And uh, the way that they, uh, you know, sort of subvert those host factors to their own purposes are quite interesting. And what we'd like to do is understand those. And we can do those through uh, loss of function genetic screens, so things like CRISPR. But we also have population screens, right? There's va variation in the human population, and that informs us of those. And it's nice to be able to use genetics to find human knockouts and things like that. So you actually can get blood and cells from those individuals to test in and make sure we're actually testing our, our products in a relevant uh, uh, system. So here's a, a cartoon from a recent paper on uh, molecular uh, uh, viral virology. Uh, this is the standard model. Uh, your, your virus shows up at the cell surface, it needs to get in, it becomes uncoded, it basically needs to re replicate itself, then it needs to sort of take these pieces, put itself back together again and get released. Um, all along the way, there are opportunities for us to understand which genes are involved, etc. And, uh, you know, which cells are uh, uh, susceptible for that. We'll see that not all cells in your body actually are susceptible to viral infection. Does that help us understand what's going on? Absolutely. Uh, does it es establish the same program regardless of cell type? If we can show, you know, the encoding phase takes much longer in some cells or the gene expression levels are really high in some cells and not so high in other cells, that starts to give us real insight into, you know, what the virus is co-opting and what the sort of therapeutic opportunities might be um, within this. Often with viruses, we don't need to wipe them out completely. We just need to give the immune system a little bit longer to get there. And so it, we're sort of back in that, that sort of example I talked about before. We don't have to kill every viral par par particle. If we just give our immune systems a couple more days, they often can, can do that themselves. So interesting examples, again, from the literature, probably ones that people know about, but there is a, an allele of a gene called CCR5. It's a, a receptor uh, on the surface of, of uh, human C T cells uh, that HIV needs to, uh, in its wild type form, to get in. And if you have this mutant, you essentially will be, uh, you know, if you're homozygote for it, you essentially will not be uh, infected by HIV. And this, this has been known for a while. And recently, FDA has approved a, an a antagonist of CCR5 for HIV infection. Hepcludex is a lipoprotein that inhibits Hep B uh, virus and hepatitis D virus from entering hepatocytes via their cell surface receptor that's in clinical trials and, and ideally will, uh, one hopes, get approved. Um, and basically, you know, here's a virus, the hepatitis virus. It's restricted to the liver because they require this uh, bile acid transporter on the surface to get in. So understanding which cells are susceptible to the virus, again, tells us a little bit about what, what likely receptors are and give us opportunities pretty quickly to, to try to identify these. Uh, one, one that uh, I'm quite keen on is sort of a slightly different idea uh, uh, on the same theme. So a gene called CDHR3 has a, a well-known variant in it. It's, a, it's an 18% allele. Um, we know it's the ancestral allele, so that, that rare allele is likely to be the functional variant, and it changes the binding affinity for uh, a rhinovirus C by uh, approximately tenfold. Uh, as reported in, in this paper here. Um, and that's kind of interesting because if you can block that, it's also an, uh, associated with a number of, of uh, other infections and, and issues. So blocking that might be interesting, but it would be a, a, an antibody therapy. So it'd be a transfusion. You might not want to, to do that just to you know not get a cold. Um, ICAM-1, it turns out, is a receptor used by HR uh, rhinovirus A and B. And so this really suggests a model that says, well, if I made a bispecific antibody, so there are antibodies you can make out there that have uh, you know, asymmetric arms, one of them could bind to CDHR3 and one could bind to ICAM1, you might actually make people totally immune to uh, a rhinovirus per cold. And as I said, this is probably not you, what you or I would ever want to take, but if you think of folks in the ICU who you probably can't vaccinate, but might be susceptible to this, this might not be a, a, a too bad of, a, a, of an idea in that sense. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, here's, here's a, you know, sort of not quite a repurposing thing, but, but, but close because ICAM-1 is, there are existing drugs for, 
or, or existing antibodies for that. Um, of course, as, as uh, Nevin uh, suggested uh, yesterday, it turns out it's nowhere near that uh, simple, of course, that sort of easy viral life cycle that I pointed to earlier. Um, and uh, you know, you, you see these things here, I'll just, hopefully you can see my mouse, this, uh, this, he was talking about these philopodia, right? So viruses don't always come in, replicate and go back out. They, we, we're finding more and more that they sort of develop these long sort of actin uh, sort of containing uh, spheres essentially, they just poke their way through adjacent cells and, and then replicate, push, push viral material into the cell next door. Um, and so this really, really changes the game, right? Because now you wouldn't expect neutralizing antibodies, right? Something that's sort of going around and trying to find these particles outside to stop the virus probably won't be as effective if it's using a whole bunch of this and then of, of these sort of uh, philopodia. And then how do we, uh, you know, understand those better and, and, and think about mechanisms to, to stop them, right? Is that, a, is that a better mechanism? Can you stop that from happening? Um, and now to be able to do this, I think we need these great data resources. Uh, and, and from that, we need lots of different levels of, of uh, variation. So I think uh, ideas are things that go across strains of a virus. So within CoVe2, you know, how much viral uh, difference can we get? How many different types of viruses should we collect data on? How many different genetic backgrounds do we want? And how much cross-species information would we like? But if you could get data sets that were reasonably well annotated at a molecular level that contained this kind of, of variation in them and were available to people, then uh, you know, this would sort of change the way I, I think that you could do a lot of the viral research. And so trying to build a, a, a suitable distributed data infrastructure that allows us to do that uh, would be of, of some benefit. Uh, uh, Rothenberger and, and, and Greg Brennan here in this paper talked a lot about the importance of looking across species. So here they're looking at an influenza virus uh, 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 gene that uh, interacts with uh, um, different uh, host uh, 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 genes to, to get what's done. And you can see sort of the, the, the effect of these through all of the, the host factors, right? And so their, their belief is it's just imperative that we consider these interactions across a broad range of host species and virus strains so that we can understand how, how the antiviral proteins really are, are shaped by this interaction through these different species. Um, in a separate review by, by Jones et al, uh, looking at viral and host heterogeneity. That's where the one, one of the pictures up above came from. You know, we have now some pretty nice opportunities to understand entry, replication, assembly, and egress. And so how do we put those steps together to really understand uh, what sorts of things might, might be important? Um, and certainly use of single cell RNA-seq in a wide range of cell types might spur detection of some of these things. Uh, CRISPR gene knockout. So again, the sort of forward genetics, this has been uh, uh, published on as well. Uh, Mike Ammerman and others at, at the Fred Hutch um, basically went through and knocked out a whole bunch of genes that were associated with a, a sort of interferon response and, and studied how much better HIV multiplied in, the, in human cells with, with different knockouts. Again, really a fabulous uh, paper and right. tracking viral expression. Per cell, this this paper uh, initially excited me. Uh, unfortunately, I can't get any of the data that actually supports their their results, and this comes back to one of my concerns that the, the single cell RNA seq world has has really not managed to publish their data as 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 completely as would be helpful to all of us. But you know, the idea of can I do single cell RNA seq across uh, blood and uh, with, within that for each different type of cell? Does the virus get into all of them? Does it replicate equally well in all of them? And, and really use that kind of information to get at what the host um, uh, uh, cell type distribution is. And then if you did that across a number of individuals, you'd get human genetic variation going and viral genetic variation going. And so I think with not too many uh, you know, samples, you could, you could build up quite a useful data resource. Um, and then there are lots of others, you know, Steve Quake and, and, and here in this one down here has a similar approach. So I think <clears throat> being able to get at, you know, viral information and single cell sequencing information and potentially proteomics in the same cells is, is not uh, uh, beyond uh, our, our current ability. 
And so, you know, I think a reasonable proposal is to think about how do we how do we start to to join together and think about what would a a, a public resource set of protocols, making sure people collect data and and contribute it in in reasonable ways could could be quite beneficial. Um, and then I'll, I'll sort of stop at that point. I think I've used up most of my time, uh, Marinka. Um, yes. Uh, stop. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Robert, for uh, this insightful talk. There are several questions. So let's start with uh, uh, one of them. And so genetics is important. However, many diseases are caused by combination of genetics and environmental lifestyle events. Um, can you share your insights into how can we capture all these complexities for target discovery? Yeah, it, it's a great question. And so, yes, absolutely. Um, and, and in general, for most diseases, the environmental component turns out to be substantially bigger than the genetic component. But one of the nice things about GWAS is when you do it at a reasonable scale, and we see that in UK Biobank, uh, as, as well as uh, at 23andMe, where the, the scale is probably about 10, 10 to 20x over UK Biobank, um, those genetic hits come through without without really much problem. So common variants are pretty straightforward. Rare variants are much harder. I, I agree. And in general, we don't see much benefit in the GWAS from adjusting even for known big environmental confounders. It turns out you know that'll change your odds ratio a little bit, but it doesn't really change whether or not you see something that's a significant hit. So in, in general, that hasn't been a big challenge. Thank you. Another question is on how to define biological processes and uh, identifying biological processes that are relevant to a disease of interest. Quite often, this is defined by disease expert and that risks being biased to a me mechanism that is already covered by an existing drug. Uh, how can we tackle this challenge? Yeah, that's a great question, and I, you know, I think just in doing this, uh, the research for for this and looking at the talks here, it's you know how we understand what the virus does in cells, we have learned by taking pictures and doing single cell and small analyses. And suddenly it's not as simple as that first cartoon of it comes in, it replicates, right? It repackages itself and goes out. We see a number of, of uh, opportunities there. And I think, you know, really what in, in general in disease, what we need to do is to start to move back like that. Um, cancer, right? If you go back to, the 1980s or maybe a little bit before that, um, you know, there was a huge thought that all cancers was, were caused by viruses. This is why there's so much virology inside of cancer centers was because there was a long period where everybody was doing virus research to see how it drove cancers, right? And then it, cancer was a disease of, of uncontrolled cell replication, but in fact, cancer is probably more a disease of uncontrolled apoptosis, right? Cells aren't listening to the requirement to quit. Right, and so as we go forward, we, we learn more, and it's you know it's the open-minded piece and the integration. That, you know, I think Marinka, as, as you've looked at these multi-scale models, where we can start to integrate that different information and see that oh, it's it's a, a number of impacts uh, on this disease and under you know that that, that get us there. So. Okay, uh, thank you, Robert, for these answers. Um, I would like to say that there are a bunch of comments in Q&A session when people are really appreciating your comments and efforts on breaking uh, data silos and pointing out restrictions on academic data use. So thank you so much for sharing these thoughts with us.